let's look at how you create those elements, then I'll show you how to create the uh, resources as well. Here's the control panel. I'm going to click on Entrances to bring up the uh, worksheet that has the entrances. Here you can see the kiosk, the first entrance that this student created. And I wanted to show you that in these outputs on any of the elements, once you've created some elements, if you click in there, there will be a drop down and you can open up the drop down and you can see the actual names of the elements that you can choose. If you do this, use this drop down, that'll prevent you from typing in a, a name that's slightly different than the element that you wanted to go to. And I'll show you how it works. Right, here's a, a, a second entrance if we had two entrances. I'm just going to call it E2. And I'm going to leave that off for a second. And as soon as I do that, if I go back to my drop down, there it shows up. So you don't have to complete everything. And as I said before, what I like to do is look at my flow diagram, go through and start creating the elements that I think I need, just putting the names in. I don't worry at that point about the arrivals, number of objects, and the other things. I just want the names across the top so that when I start trying to connect the flow, I, they'll show up in the drop down. I wanted to point out one thing that a lot of students get confused on. There's a, a prominent major element called exits. And we can click on that and you can create exits for many problems, and that includes the problems that we have in this course. You don't need an exit. An exit is useful when you have some limitation on how many and how fast objects leave your process. For example, if you were designing a queue at a bus station, then each bus has a limited number of passengers and it departs on a certain schedule, that's when you would need an exit. But in most cases for our problems, you just need a buffer to, to capture, to collect every, all the objects leaving the process so we can get statistics on them. So don't use the exits. We'll return to the control panel. Let's go to other features, and I'll show you how to set up resources. If you look here, we've got scenarios which are very useful, but we don't use them and I would recommend not setting them up. You can uh, have your distributions change. For example, if your, 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 your process starts out at a uniform distribution, but an hour into the process it changes to a normal distribution, you could set up a schedule like that. Again, we don't get that co complex. If you have a discrete distribution, in other words, you've got data you've collected, and it gives you information on a, a discrete distribution, you can, can build that discrete uh, distribution in in the model. And again, custom schedules are something like scenarios and we don't use them. We don't use the random seed. Resources we do use. Click on that and you need to create these resources. I'm going to create one called clerk because the student didn't have one and I'm going to make one clerk available. I'm going to go back to the control panel, go back to my workstations, now I need resources. If I click in there and click down, there's my resource. I'm going to say one. Over here on my two papers, I'm going to go in that box and select the clerk and again say one. And then we'll run the process and we'll see if that the distribution of people coming in is such that one clerk can handle both the one paper people and the two paper people. Returning to control panel, the other thing I want to show you are these decision points and again there you have to name it and then you set up the outputs here if I click on that again you can see I've got all these these things there we wanted one paper and two paper and you put in the percents going to each of those two outputs I would caution you that you need to make sure that these total to 100% uh, if you don't have them totaling to 100% your process won't work let's look at the buffers as I said, generally you need to have a buffer between all of the other elements of your process and a buffer at the end. Here you can see the student named the end buffer, completed, unlimited capacity, no objects in there to begin with. You could have objects in there. And then there's no output because we just want to collect people leaving the process. This is the waiting line, the initial buffer. People come in the entrance, then they go into this waiting line buffer until they can be handled by the clerks. And the, the reason for these buffers, again, is that we're collecting statistics. 
how long are people waiting in line based on the, the setup you have in your process and the capability of that process. And you'll see that if, if we have people waiting too long, then we want to change the process to optimize that. You can have things called blockages where these workstations have a throughput. When they complete an object, they try to discharge it. You put a buffer there to help, but if the buffer goes into another workstation and that workstation isn't keeping up, then things starts backing up, the buffer gets full, and then this workstation can't output, and it shows you a sign that it's blocked, it's not working. That's pretty much of an overview of how you set this uh, system up, or a, a process up in SimQuick. You need to set up these simulations, and you need to have enough simulations to exercise your system, and the time, if, if you're designing your system, and, and your uh, capabilities are in minutes, then this needs to be in minutes. If it's your capabilities are, your throughputs are in hours, this should be in hours. If your throughputs are in seconds, this should be in seconds. And you need to have enough time there to really exercise the system. For example, if you were running the uh, newspaper kiosk, you may want to run for 30 minutes, uh, you know, simulated time to make sure you can see what happens in 30 minutes, or you might run it for two hours. And you'll be giving information usually in your problem about how many simulations to run. At least five. I, I usually like to run 30 to make sure I really exercise the system.